Okay, well, um, good evening, everyone. And thank you very much for joining us for this evening's event, Investigating Corruption, the US versus the UK, and a question of whether or not it's a widening transatlantic divide. I'm Susan Coftry, Project Director at the Foreign Policy Centre. Tonight's discussion is being organised as part of our ongoing Unsafe for Scrutiny project, which is kindly supported by the Justice for Journalists Foundation. The Unsafe for Scrutiny project explores issues at the nexus of safety of journalists and corruption, with a particular focus on the enabling role of the UK's financial and legal systems. When we started discussing uh, putting this event together more than a month ago, we thought it would be really interesting to examine the anti-corruption developments, which appear to be gathering quite the pace under US President Biden's new administration, and contrast that with what appear to have been a slowing down in anti-corruption efforts in the UK, in particular since the 2016 Anti-Corruption Summit, which was held in London, and it was an initiative spearheaded by the then UK Prime Minister, David Cameron. In the last few weeks, Cameron has made somewhat of a reappearance to the front pages of the news um, as a result of his lobbying efforts for the now defunct company Greensill, which was uncovered by journalists at the Financial Times and the Sunday Times. This has sparked a wider discussion on lobbying and of course comes rather hot on the heels of several investigations raising questions into how UK government COVID contracts were distributed and sit alongside broader concerns regarding the lack of follow-on, which has come from repeated investigations that highlight London as a laundromat, as a global illicit finance centre, and an issue that was front and centre in the findings of UK Parliament's Intelligence and Security Committee's Russia report, which was published last July, to which there's been very little official inquiry or follow-up inquiry. Arguably, in both jurisdictions, the issue of reputation laundering and those who enable it is still far from being effectively understood and addressed. So to discuss all of these many developments and the challenges facing journalists and others who are trying to uncover corruption, we have a truly excellent panel and it is my pleasure to introduce them to you now. So from the US, we have Casey Michelle, who's an investigative journalist who has written on topics ranging from kleptocracy, illicit finance, foreign interference, developments in the post-Soviet space and dark money financing networks. He's the author of a new book entitled American Kleptocracy, which is due out later this year. And he's also a member of the advisory council for the Hudson Institute's Kleptocracy Initiative, where he helps making the, um, the podcast Making a Killing, which is on corruption and kleptocracy. We have Dr. Susan Hawley, who is director, executive director of the very aptly named Spotlight on Corruption. Uh, Susan has been working on anti-corruption issues in the UK for nearly two decades. And as you may have seen her this week on the BBC News and other media commenting on the Green Skill, Green Sill scandal. She was uh, previously a founder and policy director of Corruption Watch UK, where she led work on monitoring court trials, tracking UK enforcement and pushing for greater court transparency. Dr. Tenna Prelak is a research fellow at the Department uh, of Politics and International Relations at the University of Oxford. Her research centers on anti-corruption, money laundering and reputation laundering with a focus on Western countries' role in the global dynamics of corruption. She's a member of the Global Integrity Anti-Corruption Evidence Programme, and I'm really pleased to say she'll be sharing some of her latest findings with us this evening. And last but no means least, Tom Burgess is an investigations correspondent at Financial Times. He's reported from more than 40 countries, won major journalism awards in the US and Asia. His critically acclaimed book, The Looting Machine, about the modern plundering of Africa, won an Overseas Press Club of America award. And his latest book, Kleptopia, How Dirty Money is Conquering the World, which was published last year, has won similar praise and truly illuminates the interconnected nature of global kleptocracy. So I'm really pleased to welcome our panel. And uh, in terms of format, I'm going to ask each speaker just to kind of give their views for five to seven minutes um, before turning to questions from, from the audience. So if you'd like to ask a question, please do drop that in the Q&A box below. And um, with that, I think I'll hand over first to Casey. Um, I think we've been rather jealously watching from this side of the Atlantic at the positive developments over, over your way. So perhaps you could just um, outline those for us and, and, and sort of explain whether or not there is positive as, as they seem. 
Uh, sure. Thanks, Susan. And I, I will say it's been uh, some time since I have felt any sense of broader envy at certain developments in the U.S. So uh, among many things, it is a, a welcome uh, change of pace. But, uh, you know, obviously, thanks for uh, for having me. It's absolutely wonderful to be able to join the, uh, the panel today for this uh, very important uh, and topical uh, discussion. You know, I'll, I'll speak just a few moments for a few minutes about some of the developments we have seen in the uh, U.S., over the past uh, few months uh, at this point with the uh, inauguration uh, and uh, now presence of the Biden administration and some of the developments we've seen therein because Susan you're exactly right I mean the developments we have seen the rhetoric we have seen the policy proposals that we have seen over just the last three four or five months have been in many ways uh, unprecedented here in the U.S. not least in terms of the actual impacts on the ground but the potential and underlying that the actual excitement, the actual momentum uh, behind that. And, and you know, I, I tried to make a list of all of the uh, positive, uh, forward-thinking development we have seen. Again, we're talking just in the last three, four months since uh, Biden's uh, win in November, since his inauguration in January. Obviously, there have been any number of other concerning developments in the U.S., not least the events of January 6th in Washington. But beyond that, the developments within the anti-corruption counter kleptocracy space have been incredibly uh, welcome. Uh, certainly applauded on, on my end, and the momentum again continues as we speak right now. So I wanted to just run through a, a few of the developments uh, that we have seen, some of the policy proposals, some of the statements, and some of the actual enacted uh, legislation already. Um, much of it is due to the administration, much of it is due to the results of the election last November, uh, but not all of it. And I wanted to just highlight first and foremost something that didn't emerge from the White House itself, uh, but something that actually came from Congress. Because again, we have seen uh, Congress take the lead on a number of these issues and in a number of these spaces over the last, frankly, few years at this point, even under the, uh, the former administration, the former Trump administration. The most important of these being on January 1st, earlier this year, the passage of uh, what was called the National Defense Authorization Act. Within that, it had a separate piece of legislation called the Corporate Transparency Act. But that is a piece of legislation that uh, once enacted or since enacted will effectively uh, ban the formation of and maintenance of anonymous shell companies here in the U.S. Now, obviously, this is something the U.K. took the lead on a few years ago with the enactment of its public beneficial ownership registry. And I will say the U.S.'s bill has not followed suit to that effect. That is to say it will be, uh, for the foreseeable future, a private beneficial ownership registry. You know, for those who aren't familiar with this, this is a registry of the names, identities, uh, and addresses of what we call beneficial owners. That is to say, who is benefiting from the formation and usage of shell companies. Uh, for years, the U.S. has been a magnitude uh, difference as it pertains to the formation and availability of anonymous shell companies. States like Delaware, states like Wyoming, states like Nevada have perfected the formation of an anonymous shell company uh, into an art, right? You can get it in as little as 15 minutes for only $100. You never have to set foot in the state. I mean, I easier to get than a library card. You know, this is similar rhetoric we've seen over the past few years, and yet the U.S. had done nothing about it time and time and time again. Uh, and any number of corrupt, illicit, dirty money and uh, 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 drenched actors took full advantage of this. Thankfully, early January, the U.S. finally passed legislation. The U.S. will no longer be allowing the formation of these anonymous shell company. So we'll be watching the implementation of that moving forward. That is the first big one. And that was almost entirely due to Congress. And I will say that it passed over former President Trump's uh, veto, which was the first time it was a veto override. But so that was that was nice. Um, it, but beyond that is the new administration as well. You know, President Biden, ironically enough, is actually the first American president from the state of Delaware. And again, Delaware being one of the primary, if not leading offshore and financial secrecy jurisdictions in the U.S. And yet he is the president that is overseeing so much of the reforms we have already seen and the reforms that are pledged to come. And I'll, I'll just run through a few of them. And hopefully this is <laughs> the totality of them. It's difficult to try to keep up with all of these specific comments and policy proposals thus far. President Biden has publicly come out 
as saying he wants to and will continue placing anti-corruption efforts at the center of national security policy to single out what he uh, describes as weaponized corruption as a primary threat to national security. This is a development, this is kind of a, you know, a theoretical academic construct of um, uh, uh, kleptocratic authoritarian states using and utilizing corrupt our, uh, networks and corrupt actors to undermine national security and undermine national security policy of Western democracies, including the US. And, and just to take a quote from the White House's uh, national security strategic guidance, which they issued a few months ago, uh, they wrote, the White House wrote, quote, we will take special aim at confronting corruption, which rots democracy from the inside and is increasingly weaponized by authoritarian states to undermine democratic institutions. Uh, that's the end of the quote there. And again, this is such a magnitude shift from what we saw over the past few years and frankly from what we saw from any administration previously any administration prior you know you look at the personnel the staffing up right this isn't just rhetoric that we've seen out of the white house there's a brand new position within the national security council specifically dedicated to anti-corruption efforts the national security advisor jake sullivan has specifically placed anti-corruption at the center of white house policy and um, we've seen even just in the last two weeks calls for uh, from the White House for boosting the budget of the main anti money laundering unit within the Treasury Department. That's the fi Financial um, uh, Crimes Enforcement Network. The White House wants to boost that budget by 50 percent. So we're not talking about just a, a nominal increase. but We're talking about an unprecedented increase among the U.S.'s primary or the Department of Treasury's primary anti money laundering unit. Uh, to that end, we saw just two weeks ago the U.S. Uh, sanctioning, uh, uh, turning back to uh, the sanctions, utilizing sanctions to specifically target corrupt actors abroad, those who have used these methods of weaponized corruption to uh, undermine American national security. They sanctioned the uh, uh, most prominent uh, Ukrainian oligarch remaining, Igor Kolomoisky, singling him out for significant corruption, and again, continuing to lean on partners in Ukraine to uh, uh, lead their own investigations into and potential prosecutions of some of these figures and some of these actors. I mean, these are just some of the examples we've seen in just the last few months alone. And it also parallels something that is related, not quite identical, but that's also corporate tax reform and broader efforts at undermining the utilization of tax havens and tax havenry abroad. The U.S. under Biden has uh, already called for raising the U.S. corporate tax, but more importantly, creating a global minimum corporate tax, which, uh, to quote the Financial Times uh, uh, write-up, um, uh, would be the biggest shakeup in corporate taxation in decades and could effectively put tax havens out of business. And again, just the magnitude shift from what we have seen from the previous administration, the potential, the rhetoric, the energy, the momentum, um, I feel incredibly fortunate to be working and covering these topics at this time, given the development we have seen over the past few months. Again, this is not just a break with the past four years. This is frankly a break with the past four decades uh, as it pertains to broader taxation constructs, as it pertains to broader understanding of the threats of financial sec uh, secrecy, transnational corruption, you know, kleptocracy as we know it. We finally have what appears to be an administration that understands the threat and uh, what should be done about it. So I've been rambling for a while. I'll turn it back to you, Susan. Thanks, Casey. And can just feel your enthusiasm just jumping up from the screen there. Um, and it all sounds extremely, extremely exciting, extremely promising, particularly what you mentioned there about resourcing and the, I hadn't picked up on that 50% target of increasing the the budget to anti-corruption efforts so um yeah it's definitely a, a different path uh that the u.s seems to be heading down now so um on that note i'd, I'd love to turn to to sue uh to get the the picture from from the uk and uh, not to prejudice it but i imagine perhaps slightly less enthusiasm may may emerge Thank you, and thanks so much for inviting me. Um, I'm actually going to start with Cameron and Greensill, not just because I've been on BBC News about it, um, but because I think it's a real cautionary tale about tackling corruption, uh, because David Cameron was the first and really the only high-level UK politician to really sign up to an anti-corruption agenda. And he set in train a whole series of anti-corruption reforms uh, which were really phenomenal, actually. We've got, you know, unexplained wealth orders, 
beneficial ownership transparency, the creation of a national anti-corruption strategy, things that are still feeding through the system, like a, a property register uh, of overseas owners. Um, and he is now suddenly embroiled at the heart of a major ethics and conflict of interest scandal. Uh, and I think that really shows very clearly from a UK perspective, the lack of attention and, and the real complacency there's been in the UK for many years about getting our own house in order. Um, and you know, famously, Cameron was caught on camera just before the anti-corruption summit, bragging to the Queen that he had a whole host of fantastically corrupt countries coming to his uh, summit, um, uh, to which Nigeria's uh, president, Buhari, quipped, um, just send us our money back that is stashed in your banks. Um, so I think what we're really interested in comparing the US and the UK, uh, we're really interested in Biden's domestic reforms as well, uh, and the quite exciting agenda that he has around ethics and lobbying. And we're really keen to see what kind of norms that the Biden administration might set in this space, um, which I think is it underlines the credibility of anything you do on illicit finance. You cannot show leadership on corruption on the international stage if you don't get your own house in order. I mean, that that's the bottom line. And it's not just about the UK anymore as a facilitator of corruption elsewhere. It's about, you know, really how rotten is our political system is what people are talking about. I mean, we've got every single commentator and every single newspaper doing a you know, comment piece on this. Um, and it's, you can't disentangle the fight against corruption from protecting democracy. And I think, you know, if the US and the UK want to get up and have a democracy summit and they really want to hold their heads up high on the international stage, you know, there's a lot of work to do at home. And I've noticed there's been a little bit less enthusiasm about how quickly the Biden administration has been moving on the promises it made on ethics. Um, so, I, you know, I think that's a really important one to watch. And, and if they do do the exciting things that they said they'd do, I think there's plenty of scope for us in the UK to look to that and say, that's what we want. You know, that's the kind of democracy we need to be aiming for because the system is broken here. And I think it's very exciting to see as well. I mean, I think it's worth mentioning, you know, how diverse the civil society space is in the US. Uh, you know, recently there was a request, a request on an anti-corruption network for the best civil society initiative on revolving doors in government. And everyone had a different suggestion. There must be three different civil society databases on the revolving door. And one of the troubles we have in the UK is that there's very little funding to tackle UK corruption. Uh, and I think that reflects the same complacency that there has been in government, basically, that it's not really a problem here. Um, but we think you, we've got to address that. You can't have leadership uh, on the global stage. You can't really tackle illicit finance without that. Um, so I just thought um, I'd very quickly talk about the recent integrated review, which lays out the ambition of the UK government. Um, and it's worth mentioning corruption gets uh, seven references uh, in that review. Five of those are about the new corruption sanctions regime. Um, now, that regime is going to be launched by the end of April. It's coming down the line, um, and I will come back to it. But it is part of um, the force for good agenda that the government wants to see. Illicit finance does a little better with 12 mentions. Um, there's a specific commitment to tackle economic crime and illicit finance, a uh, commitment to reform the suspicious activity, reporting regime, increase the number of financial investigators, beef up the NCA, and have some economic crime legislation. Um, and it specifically refers to illicit finance when it's talking about the US as the UK's most important bilateral relationship, which it wants to work with them on. Um, I think there's a very interesting debate afterwards in social media about, um, among some commentators, whether does it matter when you talk about illicit finance, whether we're really talking about serious and organized crime or kleptocracy. Um, I'm going to say it really does matter, actually, um, and that there is a real problem here, that when the UK talks about illicit finance, it means drugs, money and people trafficking. It doesn't really mean kleptocracy. Um, and that is a problem because that's what sets the priorities for law enforcement. And we see that increasingly. We see that, you know, the NCA is going after 
um, serious organised crime, and we're not seeing equivalent action against politically exposed persons with resources in the UK. Um, and, and I think it does um, distort the kind of level of success the UK can claim, because we saw that with the FATF review. You know, the UK did incredibly well on prosecutions for money laundering, but it was almost all drug trafficking, um, and there's very little high-end money laundering prosecution. Uh, so just for comparison, the term nuclear gets 84 mentions in the integrated review and the term space gets 109. So you can see that this is quite, quite a small priority corruption and illicit finance. And um, just to wrap up, I don't think we can talk about this without the aid cuts issue. Um, you know, we're going to find out on Thursday what these aid cuts look like. Um, the Chancellor last autumn announced that we were going to reduce temporarily UK aid from 0.5 to 0.7 of GDP. That's like between 4.5 and 5 billion pounds worth of cuts. And there've been some suggestions that 80% of um, anti-corruption work uh, funded by UK aid could be cut, which included potential media freedom initiatives, which is really important for the journalists um, in the room. Um, and I think what's undermined the credibility of these cuts being somehow a budget balancing measure is the fact that the defence budget, meanwhile, is going to increase by six billion. Uh, and this is really it's very short sighted and it has the potential to do huge damage to the UK's soft power around the world. And it has damage to really sorry, potential to damage the, the new corruption sanctions regime, because uh, we all know that sanctions only work in a broader kind of policy context when they're part of a package of measures. Um, and just very, very finally, and then I will stop talking on that regime, um, we, it's a really good and exciting uh, development. Um, and it means there'll be much more scope for multilateral sanctions with the US. And we've got, it's in a way, the only concrete anti-corruption -corru initiative in government at the moment. It's the only thing where you've got a senior minister, very senior minister, who's really signed up to an anti-corruption measure. Um, but I think we have to also be realistic. Um, I've written about this for the Foreign Policy Centre. Um, you know, there are a lot of lawyers and PR people in London who are prepared to defend kleptocrats. Uh, there's likely to be quite a lot of legal challenge, which will temper how ambitious the UK is really going to be in this space. Um, and, and we have to be really clear that this can't replace proper enforcement measures and criminal and civil action against kleptocrats in the UK. So thanks very much. Thank you, Sue. That was an amazing <laughs> summary of everything that was going on. And I'm really glad you brought up the integrated review as well. And I think it's quite illuminating how few references there are to corruption, um, particularly when you contrast that to, um, you know, Biden's administration so clearly spelling out corruption as a national security interest. Um, so, uh, and also the point you made about um, the focus on serious organized crime and um, what impact that has, and maybe it sort of slightly puts the blinkers on looking at kind of the wider context, including reputation laundering and all of the sort of various actors that are involved uh, in that, which I think is quite a, a nice point to sort of hand over to, to Tenna, who's going to pick up on, on reputation laundering on both sides of the Atlantic. So over to you. Thank you so much, Susan. It's really an honor to be part of this uh, fantastic panel. Uh, so yes, indeed, I'm going to shift the focus a little bit from uh, the laundering of the monies to the laundering of the reputations. And these two are really interlinked. I mean, by now we have established that uh, grand corruption is transnational, but to move large sums of money, of course, requires establishing a presence to enjoy the spoils of the Western world. And a prerequisite for this presence and for this access is respectability. So that is why reputation laundering is really intrinsically linked with the grand corruption and we should be looking at the two um, together. Um, I'm going to touch upon three main points. So first, I'm going to um, uh, tell you a bit about how reputation laundering works in the West um, by telling you some of my team's findings in terms of researching reputation laundering and how it occurs through donations to universities. 
second, uh, I'll um, uh, touch upon how this reverberates abroad. So the ways by which this is highlighted and complemented by dynamics happening in autocratic and semi-autocratic regimes. And finally, um, I will quickly um, touch upon the access to Western polit politics and politicians, which is really the ultimate price in terms of uh, reputation laundering. So um, what happens in terms of uh, uh, reputation laundering through philanthropy? The story here is really that autocratic regimes, oligarchs, tycoons, and other powerful people are increasingly taking advantage of the vulnerability of universities in the West to associate their names with them and to burnish their reputations. So how and why is this possible? Uh, first, some, some numbers. There has been an huge increase in private donations um, in UK universities. So in the UK and Ireland, they have increased by threefold over the past 10 years, reaching about 1.3 billion pounds per, per year. And in the meantime, public funding has tanked and Brexit hasn't helped uh, in this process with uh, research funding coming from the EU also declining very sharply. Uh, the US has similar uh, types of, uh, of dynamics, but it works at a whole different level. So just to make you understand, only the University of Pennsylvania uh, has uh, fundraised $260 million uh, between 2013 and 2019. And it has emerged uh, recently that uh, these included uh, um, Chinese banks, uh, uh, money from Russia, from Iran, et cetera, et cetera, and even from Saudi Arabia's Ministry of Defense. So how is that possible? Um, the long story short is that a big part of the answer why uh, this is happening at an increasing level uh, lies in the marketization of universities, um, which is really lowering the bar of what is considered acceptable within a framework in which public funding has, has tanked. So the demand for, for this kind of for private funding has increased. Um, at the same time, the regulatory framework is either insufficient, such as in the UK, or almost non-existent, such as in the, in the US. And um, when we talk about investigating it, a big problem is the lack of upfront transparency. So for instance, in the UK, you do not have uh, any type of requirements to publish um, uh, your, your funding and where it comes from, whereas in the U US, uh, this is present to a, uh, to a small extent. Um, but also the unresponsiveness. So during our field work, which we've done with uh, elite universities in the UK and the US, contacting and interviewing uh, gift managers and uh, who've been asked also to answer a survey, uh, we actually found that UK universities were much better prepared to answer to our questions in the wake of the LSE Gaddafi scandal that many of you will remember from 10 years ago. Uh, then US universities who simply basically blank, you know, they, they gave us a, um, a, a, a non-responsiveness a non uh, generally. So we, we had very, very big problems in, in terms of reaching out to, to them uh, because this issue is really very, uh, very touchy there. So we know something from FOI requests. And I think this is also another topic that opens um, uh, the barriers for journalists and researchers in investigating corruption, because of course, also the way by which you phrase a FOI request and all the different tricks um, that allow you to actually get a re uh, request answered in the first place and within the proper time frame are very many uh, and not uh, and the general public for sure does not know them enough so it is a big it's it's all good and, uh, and well to say that we have a freedom of information law but uh, uh, this is not the same as full transparency we need to be clear about that. And from all this picture, um, it absolutely emerges that academic freedom risks being at the losing end of all these process. And we can talk about that more later on. So on to the second point, how is this amplified abroad? Um, so the competitive authoritarian's playbook or the authoritarian's playbook in reputation laundering is very wide. Uh, some of it happens abroad, as we've seen, uh, philanthropy is one of the ways, but there are also others. Uh, for instance, liberal tourism in the UK is another, is another method through which this happens. But at the same time, it is important, I think, to highlight that these uh, positive messages are picked um, from regime-friendly media in uh, authoritarian uh, countries, which pick the messages from abroad that they like and they amplify them, while attacking those that they dislike. 
Then another game happens on social media. Uh, for instance, recently Twitter has banned over 8,000 bots from the ruling uh, Twitter bots from the uh, ruling party in Serbia, which tells you something about how um, how they upped their game in terms of also attacking uh, critics on on the social media. Uh, then there are attacks both on individuals and on institutes, by, um, so on institutions, on, for instance, research institutions by placing government-friendly individuals in the board. And also there is the game of creating parallel institutions, such as gongos, governmental NGOs, or even regime-friendly universities. So it's this ambiguous game of both attacking academia, but also looking for its legitimation that definitely comes into play in this wider reputation laundering uh, um, game. Why I'm bringing this up? I'm also bringing it up because uh, sometimes the advisors of the same regimes that engage in these methods are former UK or US grandees. Sometimes are even former UK prime ministers. And I reckon many of you will already know the two words that I'm about to utter now, which are Tony Blair. Tony Blair has been advising many of these governments, including Serbia that I've mentioned uh, recently, and while uh, David Cameron and uh, his ministers are also in the in the news now, we must remember that uh, this is a game that has started even beforehand. Uh, during Blair, there, there have been very many ministers that have in, uh, engaged in these revolving doors practices and also in more full-blown reputation laundering practices. For instance, Peter Mendelssohn, who was accused of uh, uh, improperties in issuing of British passports to two wealthy Indian businessmen the ultimate reputation laundering game, right? Giving citizenship to, to somebody. In the US, uh, Trump famously came to power with the promise to drain the swamp. And yet we had Rex Tillerson, Steve Nuhin, Wilbur Ross, and before him in the Bush years, we had Henry Paulson, et cetera, et cetera. So how is this issue of the revolving doors regulated? The truth is very little or almost not at all. In the US, we had a law being, being regulated in the wake of the Jack Abramov scandal and Jack Abramov went down. But Jack Abramov is small fry and uh, uh, really uh, only people like him who are in this vulnerable position are those who, who, who usually go down. A more subtle and more rewarding game is the way the players at the top of government and business seem to effortlessly jump between the two, collecting the best that uh, each of the worlds uh, uh, has to give for themselves and, and their family. So as Gordon Gecko says it in the iconic uh, movie Wall Street, if you're not inside, you're outside. Yeah. So I do think that these two issues of the reputation laundry by autocratic regimes and oligarchs and the way that our democracies manage um, these delicate issues such as revolving doors need to be seen in conjunction. And for sure, enforcement is important, but really we do need also wholesome change of culture in order to bring the whole uh, dialogue forward. And that is also why I think that conversations such as the one we're having today are, are so important. Thank you. I will stop here. Thank you, Tana. That's fascinating and amazing how to think how things move basically in in circular motions and sadly not for the better, but hopefully maybe we can start to see some ways to unwind some of those um, by kind of bringing those uh, issues to light and, and through evidence, um, you know, hard evidence that, that, that researchers like you are collecting. So thank you for presenting that. Um, now I'd really like to turn to, to Tom and um, as someone who's been writing in the UK and the US context and actually around the world on matters of corruption, um, it would be fantastic to get your view on these developments and how you see them moving forward and what impact it's going to have on, on journalists like yourself trying to uncover corruption globally. Thanks, Susan. It's very nice to be with you, be, um, be with everybody. I, I just wanted to make one point, really. Um, I, I, I'm happy to talk about um, the way kleptocrats try to shut down scrutiny of their activities. I've got some personal experience of that, and I'm sure we all have um, tales of that from around the world. But um, we can come to that exactly as, as, as you like. But I, I just, just want to make one point that picks up on what everyone's been saying. And it's just, it seems to me there's a, a quite a glaring question, which is, why is the approach so different in the US from the UK? Um, I was in touch with Ben Rhodes recently. He uh, was one of the uh, Deputy National Security Advisor under Obama. And he had, he had very kindly read, read this, which I, I would humbly suggest that uh, anyone watching might 
want to get a copy of it's, it's kleptopia is my book from last year it's my best effort to articulate hey it's my best effort to articulate some of these questions and go around the world digging up exerting some scrutiny on the on these kleptocrats um and Rhodes said that he recognized in in in, in the book as i'm sure he'd recognize in in Tana and Casey and Sue's work, a, a world that he felt was closing in on him, that he could feel taking shape around him when he was in the White House under Obama. But but I don't think anyone would say that the Obama administration particularly stood out for doing anything about corruption or um, or, or, or kleptocracy. And maybe that maybe that's because it was back then still not articulated the way it's it's been now. But what the U.S. has obviously had between then and now is the most um, spectacular lesson at home in how kleptocracy can penetrate a democracy right donald trump a creature of kleptocracy fueled and supported by money from some of the darkest recesses of the former soviet union in business and then running the presidency as a kleptocrat would you could put money in his pocket you could take a room at uh, his hotel in dc you could take a a, a suite in mar-a-lago and you could pay the u.s president um, perhaps in the hope that he might advance your cause. Um, obviously, that was just one aspect of the way in which Trump, Trump kleptocratized the White House. But so the US has had that sh- shocking awakening of the, the extent to which the spirit of kleptocracy, if you like, can so quickly penetrate um, a democracy. And what that's led to, clearly, uh, as, as Casey so clearly explained, is the recognition of kleptocracy as a national security threat. So not as something that happens in, um, you know, hot places with unpronounceable names, with poor people that we should probably try and be nicer to and we better send them um, the, the, the occasional sort of 25 year old advisor to tell them what to do about it. Um, but but as an existential threat to to democracy. And that's why, again, as Casey said, you, if you look at the personnel on the National Security Council, um, they are almost to a man and woman believers in the important and understanders in the importance of of, of kleptocracy as a threat. And the other point I'd make about w- the, why the US might be reacting differently is it, it has the firepower to do so. Because ever since 1977 with the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, the US has had um, uh, a well-funded, skillful, aggressive unit in the Department of Justice hammering some of the biggest and most powerful global corporations, admittedly, um, never quite getting as far as a chief executive, but nonetheless, uh, in, albeit in a flawed way that we can discuss when it wants to, uh, aggressively taking the fight to corruption in a way that no no organisation anywhere was able to do. Um, and they made an enormous amount of money doing it, billions and billions and billions of dollars in, in, in fines. And so they, they can now train that apparatus on um, the, the, the targets of this national, on the, the um, sources of this national security threat of of kleptocracy. Now, the UK is in a very different position, isn't it? Because the UK ruling establishment certainly hasn't had this awakening, far from it. It is part of the problem. And um, th- there is um, that we've had Brexit and we are, are in the late stages, one suspects, but, but certainly the advanced stages of um, a, a conservative a government by a conservative party that has been very thoroughly penetrated by kleptocratic donors and lobbyists. I mean, there's a long list of major donors to the ruling party with close connections to Russian, uh, the, the Russian kleptocratic system and its intelligence agencies, which are the, essentially the kind of foreign arm of that kleptocracy. Um, it's astonishing to think that. I mean, I don't think if you turn that round, imagine if it was widely known that um, Putin's main donors were MI6 veterans and um, oligarchs from the home counties. That would obviously be greeted with complete outrage and astonishment in in, in the Kremlin. But in the UK, we've become so used to being this kind of post-imperial entrepot of dirty money that that seems to us perfectly normal now. Um, And then, so so on the one hand, we we, we absolutely lack the realisation that the US democratic system has been through. Far from it, we are sinking deeper into that mire. Um, and on the other hand, firepower. Let's say um, Boris Johnson woke up with a change of heart in, in tomorrow or was replaced and um, by someone who had a much clearer understanding of kleptocracy as a national security threat to British democracy. What firepower would there be to train on that problem? It would be risible. 
it would be risible. We're, we're about to go into an enormous test case here, aren't we? The um, the, the High Court lawsuit by ENRC, brought by um, what what used to be a trio of Central Asian oligarchs. Now that one of them died recently, so two of them left. Um, who uh, stand accused and very vociferously deny any wrongdoing, we should say, of course, but stand accused of, of um, uh, or are under investigation for suspected corruption in some of the most corruption blighted and poorest parts of Central Africa. Um, and have as their base of power, Kazakhstan, one of the great engines of post-Soviet kleptocracy. And they listed their corporation in London. And that corporation has been, is the target of, the most consequential corruption investigation in the UK. They are counter suing the serious fraud office in the UK. Um, that case soon to come before the, the High Court. That is going to be a huge test of how business is based in kleptocracies. What happens when they clash up against a uh, rule of law states? But the, the serious fraud office has been trying to do that investigation, which, again, I should say, has not led to any charges uh, and may never lead to any charges. And the, the targets ENRC deny haven't done anything wrong, but it's absolutely David and Goliath. That's completely clear. The um, the, the 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 budget, um, the annual budget for the Serious Fraud Office, um, it equates to about a week and a half's revenue for the for for the corporate interests of of, of the uh, of these oligarchs. Um, you see it in the um, uh, across the board with UK enforcement. Uh, ben Judah is done a lot of work in this area and we all know him you know he, he I was speaking to him about this the other day he used this great expression of like a, a hologram so the UK has a great set of legislation um all manner of tools unexplained wealth orders and um compulsory beneficial ownership registers and, and and so on but it is ultimately a hologram if it's not enforced you can Donald Duck can can register still register a company on 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 the uh, and record it in a company's house and is vanishingly unlikely to 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 um, to face any consequences for that. The unexplained wealth orders, soon knows this intimately, that they, they, they are um, proving very difficult to use, but in part because of the sheer firepower that they're coming up against. And there are many many other examples. And I, I think that is potentially only going to get worse if uh, the UK's political reaction. This is my final point to. To Brexit is to go towards this kind of Singapore on Thames model to to, to give up on trying to cozy up to, to to Biden on this question and to say, oh well, what we want to be is kind of um, you know a cold Macau with uh, you know very few regulations on money laundering or anything else, and to really embrace the status of being the the, the dirty money hub of, of the world. Thank you, Tom. I think, I mean, you've really illustrated the point of, of political will. Um, and uh, it, in some ways, what uh, Casey was sort of was speaking to when he opened, um, and the ideas that are that are kind of coming to some form of fruition in, in the US, or at least the process is moving along, are ideas that are, or even mechanisms that have been put in place in the UK, that, that they just haven't moved forward enough but a lot of the information that we do know about what's happening has come as the result of investigations by journalists like 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 you Tom and and obviously uh Casey and um you know some of these sort of global networks like OCCRP and others um and I just wondered if uh, especially given the focus of of our project on safer scrutiny is also around the issues uh safety of journalist issues uh, for for journalists who are bringing these issues to light if you could maybe just like speak a little bit um to the challenges that you face and maybe um because Casey and I had a conversation uh, a couple of weeks ago on this topic, and I know you've you've written recently about lawyers uh, and the role of lawyers in uh, sort of suppressing some of uh, the the information that um, journalists like yourself want to publish. So maybe if we could just turn to you to speak to that, and then come back to to Tom as well. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks for that, uh, that Susan. And, and um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll make two quick points before I talk about the, the pressures of, of journalists. This has obviously been a fantastic discussion uh, thus far. I just want to emphasize and reinforce everything Tom just laid out about the discrepancies or the reasons for the discrepancies and the uh, what appear to be different trajectories on the American side and on the uh, on the UK side. Again, so much of that is because of what the Americans, what we experienced over the last four years, not only as it pertains to a uh, president who was you know perfectly willing to describe the press as the uh, the enemy of the 
media of the people. Uh, and not even just because of the hotels that were set up and the lack of tax transparency. But if you think back to the uh, you know Trump's first impeachment, Obviously, he's also the only American president who's been impeached twice, so I have to qualify it as uh, the first impeachment. Uh, you, you think about the characters who are central to that, one of them being a wickedly corrupt Ukrainian oligarch named Dmitry Firtash, who was at the center of spinning these narratives, these ideas that got their way to Trump of this supposed dirt on President Biden. Um, and I, just as kind of a, a parenthetical aside, uh, Firtash himself is a wonderful case of reputation laundering, which Tenna knows well at Cambridge University. You can still go to the Cambridge University website and see him described as a successful Ukrainian businessman helping to uh, bankroll Cambridge's uh, Ukrainian studies program, even while he awaits extradition to the U.S. on bribery charges. And again, just to emphasize Tom's point, it's the firepower and it's it's the legacy of leadership and innovation on the American side. Uh, you know, you have things like the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, things like even back in the 1930s, the Foreign Agents Registration Act, which obviously, uh, you know, been on force for a number of decades, but the legislation was still there. So just to re-emphasize uh, and reiterate what uh, uh, Tom was saying about those differences and about those discrepancies. And, and look, I mean, I'll, I'll speak frankly on the journalistic side. I am, I am incredibly blessed to be an American journalist, to be working in a country that has um, usually a president that doesn't describe that press as the enemy of the people. And it's nice to have that again once more. And it does have these broad uh, and considerable protections under the American uh, First Amendment, the First Amendment in the American Constitution, as well as a series of state level pieces of legislation specifically designed uh, to prevent the filing of the kinds of frivolous targeted lawsuits that we have seen uh, take place time and again in the United Kingdom, uh, time and again leading to this phenomenon, I think it was Tenna that mentioned it, of libel tourism of these kleptocratic figures, of these oligarchic figures, these transnational money laundering beneficiaries and proponents turning to the UK specifically for their um, you know, legal efforts as it pertains to squashing and effectively censoring uh, scrutiny of those uh, those investigations. Now, on the American side, things are, while they, you know, some of the protections remain, things are in a sense, I mean, not in a sense, things are frankly trending in a negative direction on that front as well. And that's due to a number of, of reasons. I mean, obviously the Trump administration being at the, uh, the fore of that, um, uh, you know, we have the broader reality of uh, decreasing revenue streams, decreasing resources and funding for uh, lawyers and legal teams on the media side. That is to say, decreasing revenue for pushing back against uh, frivolous uh, lawsuits or even as it pertains to the threats uh, of lawsuits. I mean, I, I don't have to go into too many details, but there was a um, a story I wrote, I guess, was about this time last year um, about, you know, I, I think as Tom described it, uh, you know, Kazakhstan being this wonderful global engine for so many of the developments we've seen in this kleptocratic space. You know, I was writing about, it was actually a, a British uh, case, unexplained wealth orders, going against or specifically targeting the assets of the daughter and uh, grandson of the former Kazakh dictator, who's still very much pulling the strings in um, <laughs> the capital city that's now named after him of Nursultan. Um, but we received a, uh, uh, a note. It wasn't even a lawsuit. It was a single note from the lawyers representing these uh, figures that uh, my editor uh, and their legal team uh, realized, or at least went through the thought process of uh, thinking that they didn't have the resources to even fight this, uh, to push back against this. And so they effectively, while the story remains up, some of the language was considerably changed and considerably, frankly, uh, watered down, unfortunately. Again, getting back to the threats of lawsuits and the lack of resources uh, therein. But again, on the, on the American side, you have uh, watering down of some of the uh, legislation pertaining to anti-strategic lawsuits or anti-frivolous lawsuits. You have the watering down of that, the watering down of those protections. You have even discussions uh, within Supreme Court uh, rulings and among Supreme Court justices about the potential watering down of First Amendment protections uh, as well, specific to journalists, spe specific to coverage. So while on the American side, journalists like myself uh, enjoy and continue to enjoy wonderful protections that are a magnitude different from uh, any number of other jurisdictions uh, within the broader West. Things are unfortunately trending in a negative direction. Um, I, I'm not quite sure how much further things will continue to go, but um, I suppose some of that tempers the excitement that I had uh, earlier as it pertains to some of the developments out of the White House, but it's certainly a space to continue watching, um, you know, as it pertains to the story that you just mentioned 
uh, uh, Susan, you know, my, uh, myself and Alexander Cooley, who is a uh, professor, the uh, head of the Harriman Institute at Columbia University, who's done some wonderful work on uh, kleptocracy and the manifestations therein. You know, the story that we put together was headlined as U.S. lawyers are the best friends a kleptocrat could ever ask for, something to that. Uh, effect. And I suppose there are best friends elsewhere that they could turn to. But American lawyers and Canadian lawyers as well um, uh, enjoy far broader writ as it pertains to what they can do, what they are able to do within kind of the, you know, the, 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 the legal regime here in the U.S., uh, how they can move, how they can access, and how they can launder dirty money, ill-gotten gains, illicit assets, without having to file even anything like a suspicious activity report. I mean, there's a very clear and unfortunate transatlantic divide as it pertains to the EU's uh, uh, oversight of the, uh, the legal regime and what lawyers are supposed to and required to file um, when it comes to dirty money movement, dirty money laundering, illicit financial flows, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This is an expanding field of study. Frankly, there's not much that's been written about the phenomenon on the American or on the Canadian side. And hopefully the story that we put together just last month for uh, foreign policy will uh, push things in that direction. Thanks, Casey, and I'm sorry to have tempered your excitement of the bringing you. That's fine. It was, it was good <laughs> at some point. That's all right. Maybe the coffee's just wearing off. Okay. <laughs> um, we'll we'll get that article and and, and put it in in the chat so everyone can see it because I I definitely um, recommend reading it. Um, maybe we can just hand back over to you, Tom, at, at that at this point to. Uh, yeah, it's a good piece that um, Casey's bit on lawyers i'd recommend that too um i i can i read you something for a second so uh, just on this question so the, the first thing to say obviously is that echoing what casey said that um the, uh, the 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 journalists who really have it tough are the ones like the ones i have the privilege to work with occasionally in congo and zimbabwe and nigeria guinea kazakhstan azerbaijan russia so on the ones who get killed and or um live with similarly terrifying levels of, of, of threats and it's um it's certainly dangerous and difficult for us when we go to these places but we we can leave and we also have the the um support of big heavyweight uh or albeit declining um media organizations but it is still very important i think to to, to understand how um the sort of lords of kleptocracy are threatening journalism in free speech countries in, 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 in democracies. And when my book came out, apart from a threat from lawyers for a Zimbabwean businessman called Billy Rauthenbach to have me arrested and uh, jailed for criminal def defamation, um, we, we got all manner of threats. But one of the most extraordinary things that's, that's, that, that's happened is that the um, this ENRC, I mentioned them earlier, they used to be one of the most valuable corporations in the UK. They had mines in Africa and, and, and the former Soviet Union, and they're run by uh, some Central Asian oligarchs of great wealth and influence. They um, feature prominently in, in Kleptopia in my book, and they didn't like what they read. Um, and so in, uh, in, the, in the Southern District of New York, they filed a request for um, what they said was going to be uh, for, for disclosure. They wanted my American publishers U.S. arm of HarperCollins to hand over enormous amounts of information about my sources, um, about drafts of the book, and they said this was all going to be part of the preparations for a case that they still haven't brought, but they say they're going to bring a defamation claim against me and HarperCollins in, in, in London, in the libel capital of the world. But one of the things I thought was really extraordinary about this, I just want to make two points about, the, about this. Um, the first was that anyone now can go to the, the PACER, the, the, the system that records all electronic filings in the US, you can go and read the, the documents from practically any court. So this is the, this is the public record. And without any evidence whatsoever, th th this is what two of the lawyers for ENRC have, have said. The first one works at Boy Schiller. And in one of his filings that, that, that he signed, he, he said um, one of the things that ENRC were demanding from my publishers where all documents and communications relating to any compensation, terrible word, but any compensation received by Burgess in connection with the publication and sale of the book. 
And why did they want this? They said because it might demonstrate whether Mr. Burgess was paid by third parties to publish the book as part of a negative PR campaign against ENRC. So quite apart from the usual terrors of going up against um, fantastically wealthy people who don't like scrutiny of, of their activities and all the financial risk and reputational risk of that and in, in, in professional risk that, that involves, there's now this open statement that I'm corrupt. And it, it was backed up by, uh, by Niri um, uh, Shamagan Nathan, who's a, who's a big lawyer, media lawyer in, in London. He works for Taylor Wessing. That's another one of the great many law firms who work for in, in, in ENRC. And Niri, he, he, he submitted a statement in this case as well. And it says this, Mr. Burgess's compensation and who he received it from is also very relevant to determining whether he had a reasonable belief that publication of the allegations was in the public interest, particularly, particularly if those who paid him, those who paid him, also had access to grind against the ENRC. So there you have it. The just the just the um, unevidenced but stated as fact that I'm I'm corrupt. Uh, any journalist who who targets them must be part of a world where um, they're on the take. And the second point I'd, I'd, I'd make about an, uh, an aspect that I hadn't seen before of this kind of um, lawfare, if you like, is um, ENRC have also sued in London um, a former prosecutor for the serious fraud office called John Gibson. And this, again, is a public filing. I'm not saying anything that isn't in public filings before courts. Um, and they're accusing him of leaking information on the serious fraud office investigation into suspected corruption at ENRC. And uh, paragraph whatever it is, they suddenly get on to... Um, his uh, what they say are his relationships with with journalists they, they, he's, a, he's these days he's a private lawyer but they seem to think there's something nefarious in him having relationships with journalists and and, it, and then and then they say well we happen to know that um gibson met uh tom burgess in an underground car park in central london um and they described the meeting the only way they could know that that happened would be if they were watching it so there we have in um in, a, in an open court filing a statement by a major global corporation run by oligarchs that they are observing meetings between um, lawyers and journalists. Obviously, you wouldn't expect me to uh, discuss that meeting myself, but it's been Gibson himself has confirmed that it did take place and it did take place. Um, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with journalists meeting lawyers. And sadly, these are the kind of precautions we have to take for precisely the reason that it seems more and more um, oligarchs are using espionage tactics to um, conduct surveillance on those they fear may um, try to scrutinize their their activities. Those are, those are really the two sort of most two of the most extraordinary things I've witnessed recently in in, in the UK about this um, this use of the law and of kind of uh, surveillance tactics and espionage tactics um, against those who, who who try to conduct scrutiny of 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 these um, this these, the ultra uh, wealthy individuals from from the big kleptocracies. Thank you, Tom, for sharing that. And I think that it, um, in a way, it's like the story behind the story is almost just as fantastical as the original story. And um, you know, the sort of levels to it are quite extraordinary. Um, and uh, while it's quite amazing, given the fact that your case uh, and the case files are available on the US PACER system and this information is in public domain, there's quite a sort of hidden problem with regards to sort of legal threats um, against uh, journalists. Um, well, I know you're doing some what sounds like really valuable work on this. I think it's a huge problem because the, it's not only the... Um, uh, it's, it's as you say it's very rare it's only sort of through a quirk of the system that i can talk about this because the um some of the correspondence has ended up on the public record in the in, in the us because this is a sort of cross-jurisdictional case but um it's, it's so often these these cases um well they don't even become cases this is the crucial point that um, i spent the whole of you know months of last year sitting where i am now in lockdown um fending off the the most expensive libel lawyers in 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 london i got two letters from carter ruck in a day once in fact i would say that i i, I made my i'm glad to say i made my own small contribution to keeping the libel tourism industry afloat during that difficult period and um certainly keeping them busy but 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 so often this stuff obviously happens in complete secrecy i mean casey alluded to having to change his 
his piece after some threats from Kazakhstan. And, and Susan, this is why I think your work is, is absolutely crucial here. No one's really dug into it and tried to pull it all together it's to see how much journalism never gets written because pre-publication, you have to seek comment. Obviously, it's, it's a reasonable thing to do, but that, that process has become essentially a way for the rich to use the sheer threat of wealth and the threat of losses that they could, they could impose on a, on, a, on, a, on a newspaper or a broadcaster to, 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 to shut down reporting pre-publication. So the, 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 the things we see end up in court, like Catherine Belton's brilliant book, Putin's People. Now, Roman Abramovich is suing her about that. The very last minute he's, he's able to do so under the law. Um, it's a fantastic book by a brilliant, brave journalist. So that, that's an example of something we may see a bit of play out in public. And my stuff has ended up in public as well. But there's a huge iceberg of unreported material that maybe in some cases may have been it may have been correct not to report it, it may have been wrong. The, the pre-publication process may have worked and a journalist may have been persuaded that they were making an error. But I would bet the mortgage on, on there being a great many more cases of information of great public interest simply being suppressed by legal threats. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate you doing my job for me and explaining what the research is that we're doing um, and endorsing endorsing the work. It's really kind and... Um, exactly what we we hoping with the unsafe scrutiny project to to illuminate and um so you know cases like like yours um and and others that are in the sort of public domain kind of really do serve they're the sort of pinnacle of the iceberg i i, I would say um but i can see that there are quite a few questions already in the q a and I'd, I'd be very keen to turn to those and and, and invite all the panelists to to give their responses. So let me um, start off by um, there's someone with you and Grant from London here. His question is, while the USA, especially President Biden's home state of Delaware and the UK and its dependent territories are crucial to stemming kleptocracy, is there not a real danger of overemphasizing the Anglosphere? What about Switzerland and the EU states and countries such as Dubai and Singapore? Which are vulnerable to Russian and Chinese pressure, are we in danger of grossly overemphasizing the credibility of ultimate beneficial ownership records? So a few questions in there, but um, I think all speaking to a sort of similar theme. So anybody keen to jump in on, on that? Uh, yes, I can say a few words if you wish. Uh, so I think this is a great question. And my answer is no, we are not at risk of overemphasizing them uh, for the simple reason that uh, London and the US are still really key in, in all these dynamics and they remain the ultimate price. And yet uh, it is a very good point that um, uh, Mr. Grant has brought up because indeed, you know, in money laundering, um, it is a moving target. So we, we've seen also through um, the research we're doing on money laundering through real estate um, by Central Asian and African oligarchs, what we've noticed is that in very many cases, uh, the option of last resort, so when uh, the kleptocrats are um, uh, being hunted down in the UK, for instance, uh, in several cases, you will see them having a link with Dubai. Um, either by having uh, uh, by moving their their assets there, or even um, uh, running off to to Dubai and then uh, you know fighting off uh, extradition uh, cases, etc. Uh, or in in most cases both. Uh, and really, I think the role of uh, of the Emirates and of Dubai specifically in global money laundering is uh, uh, has has become very very important uh, in recent years in in many ways. Uh, I can mention Matthew Page's work and Jody Vittori's work, work on um, the link between uh, um, well in general, uh, they have a great report, I think, uh, published by Chatham House, if I'm not mistaken, or, or Carnegie, on the role of Dubai in uh, international money laundering. But then Matthew Page has done also a lot of work on specifically Africa and Dubai, and how um, really billions of, uh, of African kleptocrats money have, have, moved, uh, have moved there. Uh, we see instances of uh, oligarchs from uh, all over um, developing economies uh, um, running to, to Dubai 
when things get hot. There is, for instance, uh, uh, Vasil Boshkov, also uh, known as the Skull, um, uh, a very powerful um, Bulgarian oligarch who uh, you might have seen, um, you know, uh, in in Mayfair very often until a few years ago, and now he's uh, he's plotting his comeback uh, from from Dubai. Uh, my uh, country of origin, Croatia, has recently had its first uh, uh, fugitive uh, uh, to Dubai, uh, Mr. Zoran Mamic, uh, the brother of uh, the more famous uh, Zdravko Mamic, uh, the um, football overlord of Croatia. You can you can check uh, check them out and, and all the interesting uh, uh, and uh, quite dispiriting uh, uh, football corruption stories surrounding them. So I think that it is a valid point, you know, that we must look also at other geographies, but uh, the action needs to start somewhere and it needs to start where this problem is the most uh, co um, uh, most important, which is exactly in these geographies that we're saying, that we're talking about. And also crucially, if we let our guard down, you know, if these uh, small steps towards full uh, greater transparency and um, and greater enforcement are backtracked um i'm i have no doubts that the money will flow back immediately even the money that is not uh, still there you know that uh, will come back so uh, it needs to be an action on a global scale it is really difficult but that is what what needs to happen um so so yeah so these would be my, my thoughts on on that question i'm sure that sue will have uh, more to say um in this regard um, thanks, Stella. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, Dubai is um, becoming a number one juris bolt hole for kleptocrats, you know. And uh, it, but I, I think you're right, Tenna, that actually we don't have any leverage if we say, oh, because they're at it, we shouldn't have strong defenses. We have leverage with jurisdictions like that because we're saying this is a global fight and we've got to do something about it. But I think there's also, um, it's quite interesting um, how actually Dubai also becomes a route to funnel money back into places like the UK and US. So it kind of cleans up money. Um, so there was a report about whether aid, the aid money given to enforcement is actually stopping Nigerian politicians bringing money to the UK. And the conclusion kind of was that it's just making them clever about how they do it and they're doing it more through jurisdictions like um, Dubai. And I, but I think it is important that we also acknowledge that in all the major magic law circle firms, all the major banks, they set up in Dubai, all the big four, you know. So uh, I think there's something interesting in there about do we have enough kind of liability for the parent companies that are headquartered in the UK for how they behave in these jurisdictions? Um, because that's another way we could um, get leverage. Um, but while I'm here, can I also <laughs> make a I was really fascinated by Tom talking about, and there's a question from Barnaby about the fight back from corruption. And I don't know if any of you listened to John Benton's amazing podcast about his attempts to prosecute the uh, former Nigerian government, James Zabori. And what happened in that case, and it really relates to what Tom was saying, is that he employed private detectives uh, to smear the Met police officers and accuse them, basically make up these allegations, which really stuck. I mean, people still think that the Met, these Met police officers were corrupt because of this um, action that they took, even though the Supreme Court has said, no, there's no evidence these people were paid by James Ibori. But it, but it's the lengths to which these people will go to, but it's also the availability of the people who will help them go to, you know, do that. And I think that's where, you know, we have to start asking the lawyers, the PR guys, the private detectives, where is the ethical line? You know, they might not be doing something wrong by taking this money but they are sure as hell doing something very, very unethical by doing so. Susan, can I just jump in with a, a couple quick points? Yeah, just to, to run through the great comments that we just, just had, and obviously getting back to the question as it pertains to the potential for the overemphasis on focusing on the Anglosphere, focusing on the broader West, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I, I, you know, the tennis point, um, or to reinforce Tennis' point, no, I don't think that there is a concern, at least that I've seen, or uh, that I have on my own, and about the potential overemphasis on that, insofar as the pressure on, the focus on, and the coverage of uh, American policy, British policy, broader Anglosphere policy, 
in so many ways, sets the precedent, sets the pole position, um, and, and continues and expands the momentum for the necessary reforms. And I, I'm very happy we're talking today about this range of topics. You know, one of the, the first comments that I made, you, you know, about, about an hour ago pertained to the American Shell Company legislation, which passed in early January, obviously following the UK's lead on that. But we're talking today, less than 24 hours after the Canadians announced that they will be implementing their own public beneficial ownership registry within the next few years, which would not have happened without the Americans setting the precedent or at least continuing the precedent just a few months ago. Without the American passage of that legislation, the Canadians are not doing that whatsoever. And frankly, after the Americans passed the legislation, Canada was then the next greatest uh, font of these anonymous shell company formations. So to see that momentum continue, yes, then absolutely the Dubais, the Switzerland's, the Singapore's will continue and need to continue coming under increased pressure um, to the questioner, you know, exactly right, uh, you know, as it pertains to these other non-Anglosphere destinations, non-Anglosphere uh, polities and jurisdictions that are increasingly being cited in and utilized by these figures. We've already talked about Dubai, but the uh, the Century, which is another investigative outfit, uh, outfit does absolutely fantastic work uh, pertaining especially to the African side of things. And they had a great report a few months ago about how with increasing uh, restrictions, increasing transparency in the West, uh, more and more of these African kleptocrats are turning specifically to African real estate in Namibia, in South Africa, in even places like Zimbabwe for their uh, laundering operations. Um, and just to, to turn back to what, I mean, again, the blessings of being an American journalist, I have not ever had to experience anything what Tom and his colleagues in the British space have had to uh, experience. But again, the threats of loss um, the concerns about the threats of lawsuits, not even having to receive something like that. You know, to, to Tenna's research, you know, I had a, the opportunity to do another story for uh, foreign policy a few months ago pertaining to the American side of nonprofit uh, reputation laundering. And we had any number of case studies of these post-Soviet oligarchic figures that we had uncovered using kind of big data uh, uh, machine learning analysis, uh, donations to, in the hundreds of millions of dollars to American nonprofits, universities, think tanks, foundations, et cetera, et cetera. All of which we had to cut. We had to cut every single one of those case studies, uh, not because of any threats received, but because of the potential for threats received. They just didn't want to go through with it. And, um, you know, a shameless self plug, some of those details will be in my own book forthcoming later this year. So I don't have a hard copy just yet. Keep an eye open for it. But um, uh, again, the threats, the concerns about that as um, uh, you know, the, the, the next frontier in the kleptocratic playbook, which again, thank you so much, Susan, for everything that is happening today and everything that you and your team have continued doing on this. Thank you, Casey. And we're very much looking forward to, to your book coming out. And I think, um, you know, it's just speaking to the point about um, you, you know, we don't know what information isn't being published. Um, and Tom, you know, said earlier that there's a right to reply process, a request for information, and if taken in good faith, that can, you know, give additional information or, you know, correct uh, misunderstandings, you know, in a sort of genuine process. But unfortunately, what we see um, happening is actually that pre-publication process is uh, creating uh, a sort of uh, a cloud and, um, and and a sort of in a quasi legal frame resulting in information being either amended or not even getting out there at all and um, and how that then feeds into the, the the networks that then kind of cover due diligence uh, and you know the law enforcement information as they build cases so you know it's sort of a, a real uh, downward kind of spiral unfortunately I think you're wanting to come in Tom so I'll hand over well, to well just add one more thing just sort of pick up on what Sue said as well about the, I mean the Abori case is it's astonishing. I used to go to James Abori's house in Lagos when I was the the Lagos correspondent. He was the man who knew everything and uh, was in the in the thick of uh, on the thick of everything. And he was he was he's one of the most extraordinarily manipulative characters I've ever encountered. Um, a sort of genius for playing Nigerian politics. But the the the, the fascinating point about his smear campaign against um, the the detectives on his case was that was he's a real sort of pioneer in that respect because that's that there's we're talking about the pre-publication process right where where people get intimidated into silence but then once the allegations are out as they were in the abori case there's a different game which abori i think the, the way sue describes it's perfect abori sort of pioneered which is to um you try and do a sort of scorched earth approach to the truth it's very trumpian 
um, you, you try to say, I mean, every legal letter we get now, pretty much, almost without exception, refers to some kind of disinformation campaign, sort of ill-defined disinformation campaign of which said oligarchical billionaire is the unfortunate victim. And the journalist should be aware um, that this is going on and, should, and, and, and is presumably being man manipulated by the, um, the enemies of the, of the oligarch. And it's, it's constructing a narrative um, where it's, it's transplanting the way journalism worked in a kleptocracy and shoving that narrative onto the way it works in democracies by saying uh, every journalist is bent, every journalist has a, um, is, is on, on the take. Some are, of course, but uh, not no, near as many as in, say, Nigeria or Kazakhstan, where essentially journalism has become a way to make money from the people you're writing about. There is obviously still a, a free press attacked, though it has been in, in many ways in recent years. But the narrative that gets imposed, especially in court battles around this stuff, um, and as you said, in, in often in, in kind of smear campaigns, is to say um, everybody involved in this story, all the journalists, all the lawyers, all the law enforcement um, agencies, all the prosecutors, everybody's corrupt. And it's just um, a kleptocrat on kleptocrat battle, which is exactly how these things work in Russia. And it, but it's to switch that narrative and to and to try to um, sort of remove any sense of morality or ethics from it, and and allow the kleptocrat in question in the high court to say um, the the point isn't whether or not I prayed those bribes in Congo or whatever. That's that's irrelevant. The point is the messenger and whether the messenger has an ulterior motive, and therefore um, detaching these cases from the actual facts of corruption themselves. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's it in a nutshell, really. Um, I'm conscious of time, we've got 15 minutes left, and there's a few questions um, left unanswered. So I'd just like to, to turn to them. Um, and I think, uh, given that we, we started with sort of mentions of uh, green sill and, and lobbying, um, there's a question here from David Harley. Any views on the desirability and feasibility of changing the law on funding of political parties and campaign finance in both the UK and the US, uh, introducing state funding, as is the case in several EU countries? So maybe, Sue, um, turn to you, first of all. Well, um, I mean, Casey, correct me if my, I'm wrong, but that is one of Biden's potential uh, agendas, right? That he, I mean, whether he'll see through on it, but it was mentioned in one of the early kind of ethics reforms that he was thinking of doing that he would review um, whether it was whether he was going for full state funding I don't think it was fully articulated um, I mean it is uh, yeah there's so much to sort out <laughs> I mean we also have to sort out peers donors being given peerages you know that's a really cash for access you know, donors being given privileged access, which is, you know, I really agree with what Tennis said earlier, this is not only a Conservative Party problem, this is a cross-party problem about whoever's in power. And I and I feel like saying that to everyone who, who's saying this about this is Tory corruption, like, does anyone remember Tony's cronies? You know, Bernie Eccleston, you know, this is about the, a system failure in the UK that has to be addressed because, you know, we've even seen this with our, you know, current opposition leader is already holding special dinners uh, to explain Labour Party policy to donors. Um, so we really absolutely do have to sort out party funding. Um, and I'm not sure um, what I'm not enough of an electoral finance specialist um, to say exactly what needs to happen now. But I, I think it really does have to be. Um, addressed, um, and it's one of the part part of the reforms about protecting democracy. Well, well, we just, well we're, sorry. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. I was just, just briefly going to, I was going to add at least due diligence, right? Whether it's if, if you keep the, the due diligence, the, the system of checking uh, any MP who's paying any attention will tell you that the system of checking the origins of donors' money is is gone, is dead. It doesn't happen anymore. And there is no, there's no requirement to do an AML check even on, um, yeah, party donations, which is extraordinary. Um, yeah, so, and that should, that would be a very easy, quick fix. Um, the things about making, having only public financing, I think it's going to, would be a much harder sell. But just kind of very also quickly add, while we're talking, while we've mentioned Greensill, um, Greensill also funded an academic department. 
<laughs> Manchester. And uh, so it's not just oligarchs. <laughs> um, you know, it's a well known technique for building up your reputation, uh, you know, whether it's charities or um, universities. And, and I, Turner and I have talked about this before, but, you know, I was listening in on a call by um, people who advise high net worth individuals, and they were talking about whether the UK's unexplained wealth orders were a problem. And uh, they had someone from the PR firm saying, no, it's just all about how you sell your wealth. And instantly the issue of giving money to charities and, um, and you know, set donations to universities and named professorships came up as one of the ways of selling your wealth as legitimate. Um, so it's absolutely integral, integral part of um, the process by which dirty money uh, gets uh, laundered in our systems. Thanks, Sue. And that prompts me to want to ask Tenor a question about how we can kind of tackle that problem. But first of all, I just wanted to hand over to Casey with regards to the question on the US and, and lobbying and potential movement in that area. Uh, yeah, no, that's a uh, that's a great question. Again, you know, so much of the discrepancy, so much of the uh, uh, different trajectories that we have seen already, uh, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the American and the British uh, uh, side of things, it, it, it is uh, you know, on the U.S. side is is again directly due to what the U.S. experienced in the past four years under the, uh, the previous administration. You know, one of the things that I mentioned earlier was the Foreign Agents Registration Act, which was a piece of legislation that the U.S. passed in uh, in 1938, specifically targeted at unearthed thing pro-Hitler, pro-Nazi, um, uh, underground subterranean lobbying efforts uh, in the U.S. For the first six or seven decades of that legislation, which again required lobbyists working on behalf of foreign governments, foreign principles, to uh, uh, reveal the sources uh, of their financing and, and how they were using that financing, what meetings they were having, what op-eds they were writing. For, for the first six or seven decades, it was effectively unenforced. It was on the books, but nobody paid any attention to it. You could count the successful convictions uh, stemming from uh, FARA, the Foreign Agents Registration Act, on one hand. And then came along Donald Trump and his 2016 campaign, which injected, which reinvigorated this long moribund piece of legislation. And in the past four years, we have seen any number of successful prosecutions, any number of successful uh, investigations into these previously unregistered, previously non-disclosed lobbying uh, networks. Um, increased resources, increased personnel. Again, FARA has seen uh, just a completely unprecedented new lease on life, which is obviously completely overdue, but far better uh, late than never. And again, so much of that stemming from uh, the Trump administration and the 2016 campaign. And Biden during the campaign went so far as to say that uh, should he become president, which obviously he, he, he uh, you know, won the election in November, he would move to ban outright uh, those lobbying on behalf of specifically foreign governments, not necessarily foreign entities, not necessarily foreign oligarchs, but specifically foreign governments saying or framing it as uh, uh, wanting to maintain state-to-state -state relations, state-to-state -state communications on a purely diplomatic level. Now, we haven't seen that come to fruition yet. That has received uh, pushback among those who are within the broader uh, you know, pro-transparency community. There are a number of constitutional issues therein. We haven't seen that. I mean, to Sue's point, there have been a number of commitments that within the first three months of the administration, you know, today is the three-month anniversary of the administration, we haven't seen come to fruition. But to, to the broader point of this, this tidal shift in understanding, in resources, in resourcing, and uh, in, in framing of these issues, of the manifestations of um, uh, uh, you know the tools and tactics of this broader kleptocratic playbook. I mean, on the lobbying side of things in the U.S., God, it's going to be an uphill battle. You know, I, I would not hold out hope for any kind of public financing reform in the near future. But in terms of transparency and in terms of the uh, diligence therein, uh, again, it is a complete narrative shift, a completely different world from where we were even just a, a few years ago. So much of that, again, thanks to what the U.S. experienced over the past few years. Thanks, Casey. Um... Just again, before I come to tenor, sorry to, to keep you waiting, but I've seen one more question that I think it would make sense to follow on from what um, Casey was just saying, because there's a question um, 
from an anonymous attendee uh, who said whilst the creation of um, own, you know, the, the beneficial ownership registry um, is a big step forward, um, what is the effect of it being a private list? So it, it's not going to be a public one, um, as we've seen elsewhere. Yeah, so the effects of that are, are twofold, and I'll, I'll just touch on this briefly because because I want to get back to Tana as well, hear what she has to say. Uh, twofold. One, because it is private, it will not be accessible to journalists like myself or like Tom, other investigators elsewhere, other civil society activists other, elsewhere, other human rights activists uh, elsewhere. Instead, it will be privy only to uh, those in the American government and uh, those members of uh, foreign governments, foreign investigators, uh, foreign governmental investigators uh, that will be granted access to it. So uh, in that sense, it is not nearly as forward thinking uh, or uh, I, I suppose, uh, you know, the utility of it is not nearly the magnitude of what it is in the UK and what we will see in, in Canada. And to that uh, uh, extent, you know, the second point of that is, as we have seen in the UK time and again, you know, I don't know how many shell companies Donald Duck has set up, but he still has every right to because the lack of enforcement of and the lack of um, uh, uh, attention paid to the actual filings of uh, those company formation documents. Again, any regulation is only as good as its enforcement. It has been, as uh, I think it was Ben made the comment earlier, and Judah, um, you know, effectively a hologram. Uh, of that, and we have that is what we've seen on the public side. Without that public accessibility, because it's only private, we have no idea. We will have no idea how effectively it will be enforced, how effectively uh, and accurately the information uh, produced therein uh, will be. So those are the two components of the concerns about why it's private. Again, it's still a massive magnitude different step forward for the US. Um, but again, the concerns about accessibility, concerns about enforcement are still very real, uh, which is why we'll continue to push for it to be public at some point in the future. Great, thank you, Casey. Um, so now I would really love to turn to Tana and just in terms of the presentation and, and the research um, that you're doing at the moment, um, obviously you are highlighting the issues. So what would you like to see universities do and others that are sort of enabling this reputation laundering? Thanks, yeah, let me just follow up on something that uh, Sue uh, raised and I very much agree with her. It is not only an issue about uh, uh, autocratic governments and foreign oligarchs coming and subverting our democracy from within. Uh, we're very capable of subverting our democracy from within ourselves. So in that sense, I, uh, I find very inspiring the work by Anand Giri Daradas um, uh, and his book, uh, Winners Take All. Um, and basically his thesis that this extraordinary elite generosity of our time is what upholds a system of extraordinary elite hoarding. So, you know, this everything to change for nothing ever to change type of thing that uh, uh, Tomasi di Lampedusa um, wrote about uh, many, many moons ago. Um, and so, you know, in the US, we had the very clear cases of that, for instance, through Epstein very, very recently. And I can tell you that uh, uh, during our field work, we actually came across uh, information that uh, um, that basically when the scandal emerged, so when uh, the Epstein um, uh, scandal was uh, brought uh, much you know, more forcefully into the public eye uh, and uh, questions were raised with uh, several universities, including very elite ones that received donations by, uh, by Jeffrey Epstein, um, the response by those universities seemed to be completely unprepared. So they seemed to, uh, to say something along the lines of, we don't know where this money is, we will check and get back to you. So this tells you that really there is a complete unpreparedness um, at institutional level to deal with uh, with these kind of, uh, of threats, both internal and external, and general, generally a, a non-recognition of this as a, as a problem, um, which is uh, in, in very clear contrast to what, uh, you know, to the statements of intent uh, that many universities uh, put, put out. So, um, so, you know, quite clearly there is a problem at the institutional institutional level of even uh, understanding that this is an issue and of collecting this, this information. And this is just uh, the realization is, is just kicking in. Um, so in terms of uh, you know, where we're at and what can, we can do uh, better, um, what I mentioned earlier about, about transparency, I mean, this is 
such a clear, you know, action point. Some things like cultural changes, of course, you know, take more time. But very clearly, we need radical transparency in terms of what uh, um, is donated to, to universities. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the US has something in place, only donations um, from 20, uh, 250K dollars um, and upwards are, are uh, published. But again, as my uh, example with the uh, University of Pennsylvania showed earlier, uh, again, sometimes we miss out on very crucial information. So it, it is not a, a catch-all. The UK has nothing of that kind. There is this case Ross survey that tells us very, very little and it is voluntary for, for organizations to fill out. So this is really in the interest of everybody because even gift managers are, are tell, were telling us, look, we are contacted very often by uh, uh, increasingly, we're contacted by people with freedom of information requests, and we're, uh, you know, busy, and we would like to answer, but we don't know exactly how. So, if you have a system in place, uh, you know, that is overarching and that uh, forces everybody to um, to disclose exactly the same type of information, you will make the life easier both for you know, your own stuff, and it will be massively in the, in the public interest. And then another finding that I, I wanted to highlight is that, uh, uh, so in the wake of the LSE Gaddafi scandal that I mentioned, in the UK there was this Wolf report, the Wolf inquiry with the report. And this is what has been referred to by um, our interviewees as the Bible for um, the acceptance of, of gifts to universities, meaning that those regulations are those that uh, gift managers and university management adhere adhere to or should adhere to in the way that they conduct um, the gift uh, acceptance process. And yet what we found, you know, through our survey is that only six out of the 24 Russell Group universities um, have both an independent gift committee in place and disclosed their um, gift acceptance procedure guidelines uh, online for everybody to, to access them. And these are two very basic and very crucial you know, aspects of the report. So there is a, there is a lot of uh, room for improvement in that respect too. And just finally to wrap up, um, what also is very clear is that uh, um, university management has not been involving a big resource that they have, which is their staff. Yeah, so in the Gaddafi scandal, they haven't involved meaningfully Middle East experts that would have, you know, if there is will, that would have helped them decide and understand better the risks that are involved there. So in the spirit of involving um, academics more, um, the a working group that I'm part of, which is called the Academic Freedom and Internationalization Working Group, has proposed a draft model code of conduct. So something that uh, uh, academics should discuss and propose to their universities to, um, uh, to uh, implement uh, and to sign up to um, in order to, uh, to increase the transparency in, in gift managing procedures and also in many other areas um, related to academic freedom that are being increasingly put under risk in this uh, uh, conjuncture of marketization and of internationalization of uh, universities. That's great. Thank you so much, Tana, for, for sharing your thoughts on that. Um, I'm conscious that we are slightly over time, and I hope the panelists will forgive me in taking a few more minutes of their time just to kind of um, wrap up. Um, there have been a couple of questions we haven't got to. Um, one very interesting one about potential reprisals by kleptocratic states um, and someone who's mentioned the Football League, which we were all just chatting about before we opened up to, to the live. So um, what I might do is just kind of do a whittle round um, of all the panelists and ask them to share their final thoughts. And if they want to touch upon those outstanding questions and the football, um, they, they can do so. Um, I'm really happy if anyone particularly wants to, to jump in and start, maybe Casey, um, you're smiling there. <laughs> Well, no, no I, I think that it is a, um, I, again, speaking as putting my American hat on, I won't, I won't claim any knowledge of the developments in the in football space. Obviously, I call it soccer and football is something completely different to me. So I won't, I won't touch on that uh, uh, um, uh, in and of itself. I mean, I think, I think the question is, this is probably uh, obviously, uh, uh, you know, a fodder for a further uh, discussion later, but the responses from kleptocratic states, kleptocratic figures, I think gets back to one of the earlier comments that I made pertaining to the Biden administration and President Biden himself. Rhetoric on the threats to and concerns about the implications for national security um, within that. I mean, I think, you know, Tom, Tom was making the, you know, the, uh, 
uh, you know, commentary earlier as it pertains to this notion of this very frankly outdated notion of corruption, grand corruption, illicit and ill-gotten gains as something that simply happens over there in a faraway country with a name you can't pronounce uh, and for people that we should care about more, but you know, we have other things going on in our lives. It is very real. It is very much a reality that uh, that corruption, that those manifestations of that kind of ill-gotten gain um, and, and that kleptocratic wealth are here. They are in the West. They are in the democratic polities. They are within the broader Anglosphere, and they are upending the political dynamics of the U.S., of the UK, of Canada, of, you know, you know pick whatever country uh, you would like. So um, I guess suppose my concerns are a bit less as it pertains to state to state dynamics. That is to say, I'm not especially concerned about how the uh, regime in Kazakhstan is going to respond to American investigations or British investigations. It is more so the specific figures themselves utilizing, uh, using and utilizing weaponized corruption, strategic corruption to manifest their own desirable ends and to continue their looting, their pillaging, their immiseration of the broader populations uh, writ large, and then the specific policies therein that we can respond to. So I guess my, my quick response to that, as I'm less concerned about state to state frictions, um, although you know I'm gonna bracket Russia and China as for something for a later discussion, and more the actual usage of uh, the policies we have outlined, the networks we have described, for the benefit of these kleptocratic figures worming their way into these polities, these um, uh, uh, governments, uh, uh, you know, and, and these broader democracies that, again, speaking as American, we have already seen what kind of devastation and concern this can lead to. Um, you know, I, I can pick any number of examples for the past four years uh, as, as proof of that, but um, yes, that's, I, I suppose we're all closed. Thank you, Casey. Maybe Sue? Yeah, um, <clears throat> actually, just on football, I think that's a piece of work to be done about using reputation laundering through football club ownership, which is, I know, um, you know, some people have already highlighted, but it's fascinating. It's not just we had the, the Saudi takeover of another football club. I, I'm not a football follower, so I don't really care, if I'm honest. <laughs> but, but that's it is. I do find that interesting. But I just want to leave you with one other reason why we really have to get our act together and get our own houses in order is one of the things after Trump left I thought was really fascinating was China imposing sanctions on former Trump officials. <laughs> and if we don't get our act together, we will let countries like China, you know, grab the narrative and turn it back on us. Um, and so I just wanted to leave that as a parting thought. Yeah, and a very interesting one as well. Um, Tom, any sort of final final thoughts on football? Just to add, just to add to what Sue's saying, really, I, I think that that's already taking shape. That work, the, the the idea of calling my book Kleptopia was to try to get at this idea of a place or a uh, an alliance emerging of of kleptocrats, which is not simply states, as we've been saying that there are plenty of kleptocrats in London and New York, but um, an alliance, if you like, of these kleptocratic networks and something like the proliferation of sanctions, the, the way that that backfires, that it, it, it pushes more and more individuals and countries to join this kind of shadow global economy. Um, you know, if you put Venezuela, Iran, various parts of Africa, uh, Russia and China together, you start to get a pretty formidable economy. And you can see China with, for example, its digital current, its um, central bank digital currency, you can see Iran and Venezuela doing um, oil and gold swaps. You can see that this shadow economy taking shape and, and, and all the while in all these ways we've discussing probing the defenses of the rule of law where, where, where it exists. Um, so I think, the, I think worryingly the, 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 the hour is already quite, quite late to, to um, try to restore those defenses. Well, um... <laughs> Hopefully not all is lost, is all I can say, um, but... No, well, I mean, there's always football. <laughs> but um, certainly uh, I would like to, you know, 
hugely thank our panelists for what is a fascinating discussion. I mean, I think if I've learned anything working on, on this topic uh, is that it goes in so many different directions and you could almost have an hour and a half on one aspect alone, but it is important to try to link them all together. And, um, and yes, it's been wonderful doing that. So just lastly, I'd just like to say, so I can brandish my copy of Tom's book, highly recommend um, you go and purchase yourself a copy if you haven't done so. We're very much looking forward to Casey's book coming out, which I believe is in October. Um, is it? Yeah. Uh, no, November sixteenth. Yeah. November. Can I, can I brandish? Can I brandish my copy of Casey's book, which okay. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm looking at in an early, very privileged to be looking at in an early form, and, and I highly recommend. Fantastic. Thanks, well, my my suggestion was going to be that in six months' time or so, when Casey's book comes out, would be a wonderful time to regroup and have this conversation again and see what trajectories both the UK and the US are on at that stage. So, um, thanks everyone for for attending. It's been it's been wonderful, and um, do follow up with everyone on this panel and and follow what they're up to because it's all fascinating stuff. So, take care. And thank you. Thanks, Susan. Thank you, Susan, and FPC. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks Bye. Everybody. Bye.